freedom for freedom for free free freedom over fame free free freedom over f- cycle stays the same welcome first of all welcome this is unsolicited perspectives and i am your host bruce anthony thank you for listening and watching wherever you get your podcasts and video podcasts subscribe share like comment and rate us you can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at unsolicited underscore perspectives. You can find us on Twitter and TikTok at unsolicited underscore PER. Watch us live now. Watch us live every Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch and YouTube. Our audience, our audience continues to grow with each and every episode. And I humbly thank you. On today's episode, we might be talking about George Santos, definitely be talking about Ron DeSantis, and telling more crazy stories from back in the day. But first thing is first. What up, sis? What up? How you feeling? I'm good. How are you? Man, look, sitting here trying to get this live to work, struggling, but but we'll you, get there. I, I'm on the YouTubes right now. We are, in fact, live. Okay, so there is a delay. That's what happens. Yes. There's a delay whenever whenever I set it up. So hey, look now now we now we know, and uh, knowing is half the battle. Go, Joe. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Go Listen, Joe. we are millennials, so. Right. Like, we know technology, but we don't know technology, you know? So there's going to be a learning curve. And, um, all right. Yeah, you know, look, going live is a new thing. You right. know, it's only the second season of the show. We just decided to go live. And you, we're working you, out some of the kinks. Say yeah. what? You you decided, yeah. I did decide to do that. And yeah. um, I'm completely confident in the fact that that we will get it done and we will get it taken care of so um how how's the audio looking audio is looking good not too loud this time okay i'm gonna turn back mine is in the yellow a little bit i'm turned down a little bit i feel good i feel good i feel like we're off to a great start (laughs) (laughs) all right so let's get right to it Mm -hmm. i sent you something And I'm going to give everybody, give everybody the backstory. So there was a Chris Evans on Twitter, uh, posted a video. Not that Chris Evans, not that Chris Evans, not, not Captain America, but he is doing a lot of great things for America by his tweets and his posts. Mm -hmm. So he posted something on Twitter about, uh, some people that were flying Southwest. They got pulled off the plane Mm -hmm. and they were seated on the plane and got pulled off the plane. Now, the backstory is that they were actually interviewing. Southwest had flown them out to interview them for whatever positions, right? So they had non-revenue tickets. So because they had non-revenue tickets, anybody that had bought a ticket would supersede them, which, okay, yes. I kind of understand that That's if you... Fair. bring if you, if you let the people know this, but they had already been on a plane and had been seated. They were pulled off the plane to make room for paying customers. Right. So they were like, okay, that's fine. You can just find us another flight. So Southwest was like, we did. We found you another flight for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, wait a minute. We hadn't planned on staying here tonight. Like, are there going to be accommodations for us to stay over tonight? And Southwest was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll find you a hotel room at a reasonable rate. And they were like, well, wait a minute, I don't have money, no matter how reasonable the rate is, I don't have money to pay for a hotel room. As the flight, what are the people that, that aren't flight attendants, they're the ticket checkout people? Um, I don't just, I don't, customer service. Customer service. As the customer service rep is explaining everything to them, the three ladies who had came in for the interview were starting to get a little bit more agitated by the fact that they didn't have accommodations. They were removed from the plane and Southwest really wasn't trying to help them out. So the customer service rep is like, Hey, right now you're representing Southwest. I'm gonna need you ladies to calm down. 
because this isn't looking favorable to your employment. And the question then becomes, do you even want to work for Southwest after they do you like that? Like they, the, as, it, as the video continues on and they're getting more and more agitated because there's no real help that's being given to them. They have to stay overnight. They're, Southwest mm-hmm. is not paying for their hotel. They're not giving them accommodation. These people that Southwest flew out for a job interview. Right. Would you even want to work for that company? And it, and it also the customer service rep is just like, basically, y'all, y'all not going to get hired with the attitude that y'all showing right now. So I just thought this was fascinating. Like, this is how we're treating workers now. And everybody complains like, oh, nobody wants to work. No, nah, people want to work, but they just want to be treated fair. Yeah. Um. So when I was watching it, because you, you sent me the clip and I watched it. When was that taken? Like, when was that? Because now Southwest used to have a reality show. I didn't Um, know this. Southwest used to have a reality show? Southwest did used to have a reality show. I used to watch it. Um, And, oh, God, it was called Airline. Um, And I don't don't remember what network it was on. Uh, Oh, A&E. Yeah, because... I used to watch it and it was just basically the day-to-day operations of like the daily happenings and they would pick a few airports and they would just, and it was Southwest. It was the Southwest and all the shenanigans, right? All right. So it had to be during this show, the show. That's what I think. Um, And that show, it was a while ago. Uh, It was a while ago, but no, in answer to your question, no, um, <laughs> but I wouldn't want to work for a company if they treated me like that. However, the gate agent, that's what the, that's what it is. Gate Thank agent. You. The gate out. agent, um, I don't believe has the ability to just pay for, um, accommodations for people. But like that would have been his opportunity to like reach out to corporate. Hey, I understand, guys. This is not something you were prepared for. Obviously, we didn't, you know, prepare to over book the flight, and you know, because uh, because you got free tickets, you got you got booted off the flight. We, you know, but we'll figure something out for you. Yeah, the, uh, Southwest should have taken accountability for that. Um, but they were getting a little little reckless in there. They were I getting. Mean- a- you wouldn't get reckless in that situation that you got to come out the pocket. What if you flat broke? That's the reason why you coming in for a job interview in the first place. Mm-hmm. You flat broke. They flew you out here and you come out for the interview. They, you, they going to fly you back that very same day. So the only accommodations you got to make is getting to and from the airport. Right, right. now, all of a sudden you got to pay for a hotel room. I don't know what city that they were in, but hotel rooms aren't cheap. I mean, they were it, going back to Norfolk. I don't know where they were from. Uh, look, look, it, it, look, if they was in Norfolk, I mean, maybe they, they yeah, maybe they, if they was, if it was Southwest, where's Southwest hub is Southwest hub in Atlanta. Southwest doesn't have a hub. Mm, that's part. That's the reason why they that's had a lot the, of the uh, yeah. issues that they had. Yeah, that's they had. Um, but no, the show airline, it was, it was, uh, it was focused on passengers and flights originating out of Southwest Airlines, focused on the, the BWI, Chicago Midway, Houston's Hobby Airport, and LAX. And it was a great show. I encourage anyone, if you can find it, to go see it. But yeah, it's, um, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean. If they was flying out of Norfolk and they, let's say they had to fly to Baltimore, look, just give me a rental car, I'll drive. Just give me a rental car. I feel like. I feel like everybody was a little wrong in that. He definitely shouldn't have been calling into question. They had a right to be upset. He definitely shouldn't have been calling into question their potential employment for being upset that they're not being offered any kind of real remedy for a situation that was beyond their control. And I'm here because of Southwest. Right. Like, the I'm only not, reason why I'm here is because of y'all. Right. But I think this leads to a bigger issue. This may have been further away, but, you know, people are complaining. And I forgot what the phrase that they were using, that this was the mask 
this was the mass time of the uh, notice. Like people were just giving in a notice and leaving jobs. And that's because people realized that they could have their life back with remote working. And mm-hmm. they don't want to go back to having to go into the office. And some of these companies are like, no, you got to come back to the office. No, I won't be. I'll get another job where I can work from home. Or I, at least I, have that I, option. Yeah, my previous employer, I straight up told them, no. Right. I'm not coming back in. The last <laughs> time I came back in, I got COVID. Because of y'all. I'm not coming back. Because yeah. of y'all. I'm not coming back. Y'all want to throw a party, and I got COVID because of y'all. And I got COVID. I'm not coming back. Right. I mean, I guess. I will be in my home. Thank you. And that's the way to be. <laughs> that's, um, that's... But no, there's this, I, I saw something, um, and it was like millennials sitting back like proud aunties watching Gen Z quit jobs because the vibe is off. I mean, that's true. It's it. Nobody is, uh, you know, unemployment is down. I think unemployment is like 3% or 4%. It's lower than that. Right now. It's lower than that now. Yeah. I mean, people are working, but they're working smarter. And uh, a lot of companies are playing catch up right now to completely restructure the way that they do business around this new um, kind of worker centric mindset of mm-hmm. like, Hey, I am, I am the, the resource here that you need. You know what I mean? I mean, I even have changed the way that I interview for jobs. Now we're interviewing each other. Right. It right. used to be you go in, you're nervous. Oh, I really want to get this job. I'm so nervous. What are they going to ask? No, we're interviewing each other. I'm asking them very difficult questions back. Why is this position open? What are some of the challenges that you're finding with current employees? What is the turnover rate and what do you think is contributing to that? What are you guys doing to fix that? And what's the, what are the stages for implementation of these changes? Like I'm, I'm making this, this, this is not, we're, we're not, nobody is going for the, this capitalist environment of hustle culture and uh, you you're born you work yourself to death and then you die and that's nope. it nobody's do we not doing this no more nope, we have had yet. a chance to sit at home with our by ourselves or with our families and really reassess how we want to live our lives how we want to show up in the world what we want to do for work how we want to maintain a work-life balance and and have more free time and things like that and these companies got to catch up I don't have to deal with that, but you're, you're lucky. Congratulations. <laughs> I don't have to do, but maybe one day, maybe one day I had to deal with something like that. I wouldn't even know what it would be like to go in for an interview right now. Cause I, I haven't been in an interview. I don't, and I don't know how that's not true. I went on an interview before the pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm not gonna take this job. Y'all gonna make me wear a suit to work. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I rock yeah. sw- Everybody know me. I know I rock sweatsuits. That's what I want to yeah. do. I want to rock sweatsuits for the rest and of my so life. And so do I. <laughs> Uh, I got a I got a job that allows me to work from home. Jay got a job. Got a job. <laughs> At Whack Arnold. <laughs> All right. Okay. We've already talked about Whack Arnold's and had a little bit of a joke. Mm-hmm. I wanted to joke. Starting off with politics, talk about George Santos, because he out here lying again. When does it end? Like, honestly, when does it end? So last night you sent me his, I guess they were expense reports. Oh, Scott! <laughs> <laughs> Political reported. So when you have a campaign, you're a politician, you have to show receipts for your expenses over $200. When they looked at George Santos's expense report, Politico reported that he had about 41 different uh, entries in his um, expense reports for in various filings. things, various things, staples, uh, Ubers, um, restaurants, airline tickets, and they were damn near all $199.99. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> which, which tell the people why that's important because he doesn't have to submit a receipt for it. 
because it's under $200 by literally one cent. But it's so obvious when you finesse, <laughs> there is a level of detail to finessing. Exactly. To where people don't know that they've been finessed. There is a way to do this. And I'm sure that there are many politicians who finesse their campaign resources and use it for personal stuff. And they, fin but I have finessed. I have, Hold on, I stop, stop. Cause this is being recorded and it's going to be put out in the world. You don't want the IRS after you. So let's not talk about. Oh no, finessing. I never finessed. I never finessed like that. First oh, okay. of all, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not beholden to the American people in any way, shape or form. Okay. <laughs> you beholden to the IRS. We are yeah, beholden and to that. I, and, and guess what? They going to get that smooth, uh, uh, 1040 from me later on this month so they can chill okay. out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they can chill. Um, but, but when you finesse, there is an art to it. I have met finessers and it's truly it's like painting forgers. Like it's an art to finessing that he does not have. It was a blatant and egregious lie. You, all ever up seen, and you ever seen that video where they're like a family or a couple stack a whole bunch of bottles in a hallway and you see the cat maneuver through the bottles mm -hmm. in the hallway mm -hmm. and not knock over any bottles. And yes. you see the dog look at it, look at it, and just run through the bottles. Yes. Real finessers move through the bottles like the cat. Through the bottles, and you're not supposed to be detected. Right. Santos runs straight through. Barrels through the bottles. But that that was... Knocks every roll of toilet paper over. That was last night. Today I sent you an article Yes. That the person that's supposed to sign off on all the campaign finances and stuff like that, they basically forge a signature. He was like, hey, hold up. Hold up. I don't work for y'all. Yeah. I don't work for y'all. That's I y'all forged my signature. That I don't I don't have nothing to do with that. Never, never worked for you. <laughs> when does it end? And this was recent. This wasn't like some thing yeah. from a from a while ago. This was recent. This Let was me you something. Yes. It is it's what, 7.53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? George right. Santos is lying right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, because he's got a problem. Yes. He can't help but lie. It's, it's habitual. But He is a habitual line stepper, and he is a habitual liar. <laughs> but I, Santos wasn't the politician I wanted to talk about. I, I couldn't right. help it. It's the third week in a row where we got to bring him up. But he's not the politician I want to talk about. Yeah. Ron DeSantis. I know I love calling him DeSantos. Yes, you do. Because thinking about him makes me lactose intolerant. So DeSantos, yeah. lactose. Okay. Yeah. Also, Mentos, not a great mint. Well, the strawberry kind was pretty damn good. What's that, a chalky kind of? No, the know. strawberry kind was pretty good. I mean, they, they're instant cavities, but it was pretty good. Yeah. But Ron DeSantos, Santis, Santis, see, I was already said, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> And his stop woke act, and and a lot of people that were talking to me this week was like, I thought that you was going to talk about this last week, and I was like, I was too angry to talk about it last week. I needed to calm yeah. down. Yeah. But I just got angrier because more information got out. So, mm -hmm. in his stop woke act, he's decided to end an African American studies AP course. Mm -hmm. AP stands for Advanced Placement. Yes. Which means you have to, I mean, you could try to get into the course, but not every student can get into the course. You have to maintain a certain GPA to be able to be in an AP course, right? It's an elective. It's not a course that is, that you have to take, number one, and it's a college credit course that you could take in high school. That's what advanced yes. placement is. So the yes. Santos, Santis, <clears throat> I can't stand this dude, the Santis decided Nope, that goes against our Stop Woke Act and canceled the class completely. I'm well, going so to let you go. Yeah. And then I'm going to give my two cents. So as a former AP student, by the way, um, I am quite familiar with AP studies. Um, so the thing about this particular course 
is it's still in development. It's only in its pilot right now. It's still in development. And this year it's only in about 60 schools, select schools across the U.S. We don't even know if one of those schools is in Florida. Okay. <laughs> so the program isn't even complete yet. No, it's, but they, they, it is, there's at least one school that is in Florida. At least one that is yep, in Florida. There is at least okay. one. Okay. So, but the point is, it's, it's in a pilot. Um, and so you would think you would reserve any criticism until the final iteration of the program is out, but that's, that's a normal person. So this program has been in development for more than a decade, right? Which feels right. Mm -hmm. We, we have substandard at best African and African American studies content in U S public schools since always, right? We've never had really thorough or comprehensive African and African stu American studies in U S public schools. And in my opinion, in our current, you know, social political climate, getting this class right, like touching on all of the nuances to our history um, and making it well-rounded is a must and we deserve that. So um, them taking their time to really tap uh, um, leading academics uh, in, in the areas of African and African American studies and really do the work on this. I read, um, I haven't gotten a copy of the entire curriculum, but I've read um, the outline for the course and it is incredibly thorough. It is, I, I almost cried. It's beautiful. Like it's incredibly beautiful. Um, and it touches on just everything. I went on the um, College Board website and it touches on everything, literature, arts and humanities, political science, geography, science, not just of the African-American experience, but also it starts, the start of it is in Africa and talking about important civilizations and advancements within Africa and African history, which I think... Mm -hmm. Um, is also sorely lacking. I mean, typically we get like a paragraph, to be honest, if that. So this course wouldn't even really go live until the 2024-2025 academic school year with the first AP exam being in the spring of 2025. So this is not even something that's happening right now per se, and he's already like, we're not doing it. He, he's, he's banned it. Um, well, the Florida department, the Florida education department, which saying that feels like an oxymoron, um, <laughs> is they said they have six areas of concern. Okay. Um, among them being intersectionality, which they say the Florida educational department say it, quote, ranks people based on race, wealth, gender, and sexual orientation, which it absolutely does not. Intersectionality is just the understanding of how multiple forms of oppression can act on people simultaneously. What they meant to say was America ranks people based on their race, wealth, gender, and sexual orientation, and intersectionality points that out, and we don't like that. That's what they meant to say. Um, they took issue with a lot of the reading, the authors of the different readings, um, like Kimberly Crenshaw, Angela Davis, um, Roderick Ferguson. They took issue with the course on Black Lives Matter. Um, they took an issue with um, Bell Hooks, um, who was a leading um Fe a black feminist writer and also who wrote extensively on intersectionality. I know pretty much any black feminist out there, including me, has a copy of Ain't I a Woman in their bookshelf. They didn't like that there was a discussion on reparations. Um, and they didn't like uh, another uh, writer um, and author, Robin uh, D.G. Kelly's writings on performative activism, um, particularly in higher education. So all of that to say, 
that essentially what Ron DeSantis is doing is he says that this course is indoctrinating students, right? But what he's actually doing is indoctrinating the students, mm -hmm. only the white ones, because obviously conversations about race and class are occurring in households of color. He's indoctrinating students through omission. Mm -hmm. um, and it was funny, I was watching Ibram Kendi, uh, who's an author and a professor, um, was on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. And um, Stephen Colbert asked him about CRT. And he was saying, like, you know, the pushback you're getting is that white people feel like it'll make white kids feel bad for being white if they learn about black history, which is not the actual issue. Of course, we both know that, you know, the Florida Department of Education and Ron DeSantis pretty much told on themselves when they listed their concerns in the curriculum. But Ibram says, if that's the case, okay, what you're really talking about is the teaching of slavery. When we teach kids that white people enslaved black people, we're also teaching them that black and white people join together as abolitionists to fight against it. And why can't these white children instead identify with white abolitionists? And I thought that was really a poignant question and he left it rhetorical, but there is an answer. And again, you get hints of this answer with this, uh, what is it? N uh, against Woke Act? Yeah, Stop Woke Act. Stop, stop Woke Act. Yeah, yeah. Stop Woke Act. And, and the answer is also in the persistent use of the Confederate flag. It's in the protest for removing Confederate statues. They never wanted abolition. And they certainly don't want their children or their grandchildren identifying with abolitionists. They don't want their children becoming complicit or worse, active participants in social political reformation because it plays into their fear of not just losing control and power, but of becoming obsolete. And they get more and more bold, but also reckless when they show their hands like this so openly and saying the quiet part out loud. And that's what you're, that's, that's what's happening essentially. When I, and when I dug deeper into this, I'm like, oh, what are the actual concerns? Oh, you don't want people learning about intersectionality. Ah, oh, you don't want any talk of reparations. Ah, I see. You don't want kids to know that true social change is happening through activism and not through the government. The government is not actually making our lives better when we are, uh, passing laws like the Civil Rights Act it is because the groundwork was led through activism, mm -hmm. through the people and not through politicians. Because what does that say? Is that the actual role of politicians in government isn't necessarily as important as they want us to believe that it is, that it's actually the people who are the true agents of change, particularly young people, particularly young people who have access to knowledge that they wouldn't ordinarily have access to. So ladies and gentlemen, my very smart, eloquent, well-spoken sister moved like that cat in the hallway and was able to break down exactly what's going on without knocking over any bottles. Hmm. Now, here comes her big brother. You about to bowl through them bottles? I'm about to bowl through the bottles because All right. I'm going to go behind the scenes. Okay. Ron DeSantis was propped up and won re-election by, a, I guess, a landslide by governor race standards. Mm -hmm. Because there was a political group though they kind of say that they're not a political group. There was a political group pushing them all during COVID, the Moms of Liberty. For those people who don't know what the Moms of Liberty is, they're an organization that has campaigned against COVID-19 restrictions in schools, including mask and vaccine mandates, and against school curriculum that mention LGBTQ rights, race, critical race theory, and discrimination. 
Listen to that last word, discrimination. Mm -hmm. And multiple chapters have also campaigned to ban school library books that address gender, sexuality issues. Now, how does that connect to Ron DeSantis? Bridget Ziegler, a co-founder and former co-director of Moms of Liberty, is the wife of Christian Ziegler. Who is Christian Ziegler? The vice chairman of the Florida Republican Party. You see that the connection right. here? That feels right. You feel the connection there? That feels but, right. But the Moms of Liberty, see, this is the reason why history is so very, very important. The Moms of Liberty are nothing more than a new version of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. You don't know who the United Daughters of the Confederacy are? Their stated intention was to tell the glorious fight against the greatest odds a nation ever faced that their hollowed memory should never die. The primary activity was to support the construction of Confederate monuments and memorials that organization i'm talking about the united daughters of confederacy mm -hmm. established the children of confederacy listen to what i just said there the children of the confederacy it was to impart similar values to younger generations through the mythical depiction of the civil war and the confederacy the UDC utilized children of the Confederacy to impart to raise generations their own white supremacist version of the future. Let me let me go back because maybe you didn't hear me. The Daughters of the Confederacy started a group called the Children of the Confederacy and the mm -hmm. sole purpose was to create this mythical idea that the Confederacy was on the right side of the Civil War. And it was all to maintain white supremacy. And yeah. when, when did this come into effect? Right after Reconstruction. I'll get into yeah. that in a minute. I'll get into that in a minute. Have you heard of Birth of a Nation? I'll get into that in a minute. I, I, I'm telling okay. you, I'm going there. I'm knocking over you're all going, the bottles. Going, I'm oh, knocking over I'm all the bottles. I'm ready. The, the Daughters of the Confederacy also demanded textbooks for public schools that told a story of the war and the Confederacy from a definite Southern point of view. They changed our textbooks. Mm -hmm. This was in the early 1900s, right? What are the Moms of Liberty doing right now? Changing the textbooks. Yeah. To, to change the narrative of what happened, let's just say from reconstruction to now, mm -hmm. to make it not so bad, to make it more palatable. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to get rid of the history. What history you might you might not be talking about? Well, let's talk about reconstruction. What is reconstruction? Reconstruction was a military occupation of the South after the Civil War to kind of clean up things in the South and to make sure that black folks the freed slaves had a fair shot of freedom. That lasted about four years. Then the president after Lincoln, I'm not even going to mention his name. The president after Lincoln was like, ah, I'm not all for this reconstruction. We're going to pull our people out of there. What mm -hmm. happened when the military pulled their soldiers out of the South? The rise of the Klan. Oh, hell broke loose. Yeah. The rise of the Klan. Segregation. <laughs> When people talk about critical race theory, critical race theory, in essence, is explaining that race is a social construct that was created by society, American society, mm -hmm. and that it was created in a way and the structures were created in a way to keep certain people in place. Yes. And you say, no, that's not true. America isn't a racist society. If it wasn't a racist society in the 1900s, after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, there were registered Klan members in Congress, mm -hmm. in the Supreme Court, 
in the White House. There are now. Well, they're not registered Klan members. These people, you could check the, if there was a registry. Right. The last one they say may have been Truman. And when was Truman president? You got me. Oh, you're the history buff, not me. It was after World War II. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it was after World War II, right? When, yeah. when, by the way, black soldiers were fighting in World War II. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny that DeSantis is trying to basically not tell history in the state of Florida when the state of Florida has two. Some people don't even know about the main one, but I'm not going to say main one, the one that a movie was made off of, but has two massacres. Rosewood. Mm -hmm. If you don't know about Rosewood, open up a book. A lot of you people don't know about Rosewood because hell, I didn't know about Rosewood until they did a movie about it because it wasn't in any of my history books. And once again, I'm a history buff. When it comes to history, I want to learn about it. I didn't know Mm -hmm. about this. And what is Rosewood? Well, it was a massacre that they say only six people died, but most people say that it was closer to about 27 to 150 people died. And basically a black man was accused of attacking a white woman. Mm -hmm. And so they... White people, a mob of white people went into this town. They killed at least six people. They burned buildings and churches and blew up businesses and destroyed a whole black community. Mm -hmm. So much so that people from Rosewood ran away and never really came back. It was a black, a thriving black community that was destroyed. This was in 1921. It was so long ago, Bruce. Okay. All right. This is history. Mm Mm-hmm. But I bet you didn't know about the Okoye massacre. Okoye is a town in central Florida, not too far from Orlando. Mm -hmm. It was a thriving black town because it was a part of the railroad system. So -hmm. there was a lot of farming, you know, Florida farming, fruits and vegetables, big, big industry down there. A lot of black people were thriving in this community. Mm -hmm. And remember, Reconstruction is long since been over. Segregation is now the rule of thumb. And what happens in segregation? Well, we're going to restrict your right to vote. There was a huge election that was coming up in, in, in this town. A gentleman got denied the right to vote. He went back to the polling station and said, no, 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 I'm supposed to be able to vote here. They attacked him. Because they attacked him, they said, these uppity black people, we're going to attack everybody. So they mobbed up, a bunch of white people mobbed up, went in and destroyed this town. Kind of mm-hmm. similar to Rosewood, right? Destroyed this town. So much so that people left and they didn't come back. For those that did come back, they really didn't tell the story. There's some post-traumatic stress that's associated with that. Here you are, this thriving black community where they say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. They did. And because of jealousy and a restriction of their rights, all of that was taken away. And that's not to mention, that's just the state of Florida. That's not to mention the Tulsa massacre, which most people didn't even know about until the movie, uh, until the TV series on HBO Watchmen came out. And then it's like, what is this thing about the Tulsa massacre? The Tulsa massacre was about Black Wall Street. You heard that right, folks. Black Wall Street, another thriving black community that they came in dropping bombs from airplanes once again, because a gentleman, black gentleman was accused of attacking a white woman. Isn't that also what happened to Emmett Till? How many stories of lynchings and cities and towns that were destroyed that you don't know anything about? I remember, go ahead, Jay. here, Here in Georgia, under a popular tourist destination or a popular vacation spot, Lake Lanier was a former black town that was destroyed, leveled, and they put the lake on top. And now people go there and they vacation and underneath was a prosperous black town underneath this lake. There are stories of this over and over and over again. All and, across the U.S. And most people don't have any idea about it. And they say, well, Bruce, that was 100 years ago. 
that was just 100 years ago. Not only after that, not only do you have segregation, you had redlining, you had uh, gentrification, you have uh, look at look at cities and how they're formed in Washington, D.C. There's a metro that goes all around the city except for one area. Because that one area has always been the most prosperous area. They mm -hmm. didn't want certain people to get into that area. So they built a public transit system so that you could get around almost anywhere, but not everywhere. Yeah. A friend of mine said Long Island was specifically built to segregate people. So when you say, I remember years ago I was bartending. And I made an off can offhand joke about slavery. And there was a, a younger white girl there. She was probably, she was still in college and she mm -hmm. was like, oh, that was so long ago. Why don't you get over it? I had to calm myself down because I took it upon myself. I was going to educate her and yes, I went through, I was, yeah. And, and I was like, yeah, okay. You got slavery, you got reconstruction, you got segregation, you got the redlining, you got whole housing discrimination, you got police brutality. Oh, by the way, police were used. You think this isn't true? Look up LA police in the fifties and sixties. Police were used to keep black people out of certain neighborhoods. Never mind the fact that you couldn't buy a house in there. You couldn't even go through the neighborhood. There was police that were there to beat you to make sure that you couldn't go out in the neighborhood. Oh, by the, the way, the idea of organized policing started to capture fugitive slaves. Exactly right. Oh, and the by police the way, have never been here to serve us. By the way, with black people, and mm -hmm. this goes all the way up until the eighties. Okay. Things for loans, credit cards and things like that. Black people were often given higher interest rates even if their white counterparts had the same employment history, economic base in the whole nine. Because credit is a new established thing. Credit was just established in the 80s, I think. Yeah. I think that your credit rating, your credit score, all that was just established, like in my lifetime. So yeah, that's cool. a new thing. But interest rates for loans and stuff like that, always higher. So black people are always paying a higher percentage. So not only am I telling you about the rules, laws that were written by people that were in the Klan, hmm. people that were in the Klan because they were in the Congress, they were in the White House, they were on the Supreme Court. They were making the rules. Here's the structure of America. America isn't a racist society. And, and the making white kids feel bad about being white. That's not the, that's not the reason. Even if it, even if it does happen. What you're seeing is guilt. Mm. Guilt in and of itself isn't a bad thing. No. Guilt is that arrow on your moral compass to make sure you're pointed in the right direction. Without guilt, you will have no sympathy. You will have no empathy. If you have that, you won't even try to have understanding mm -hmm. of another person's plight. Guilt is a good thing. And it's not purposely meant to make you feel guilty. Telling the truth isn't meant to make you feel guilty. But if it makes you feel guilty, that says something. That says something. It says a lot. So instead of denying the truth, because what I just rolled down was history. These are stone cold facts. This isn't some theory. So this isn't some woke nonsense. This is American history. You don't want to listen to it then you just don't want to be, you want to be ignorant. Nope. Ignorant is when you don't know something because you don't know. It's a willful ignorance. Th that willful ignorance is stupidity. You just want to be dumb as hell. Okay. Be dumb as hell, but don't get pissed at me if I shove it down your face. Cause I'm gonna shove it down your face. You're not going to ignore it. You're going to accept that guilt and it's okay mm -hmm. to feel guilty. Guilty makes me stay in line and make sure that I don't, disrespect people right we need it once again it's the arrow on our moral compass so that's you know that's that's what i got to say you know it, you could tell by my animation you could tell by the voice yeah that i'm angry yes. i'm angry because i see history repeating itself again 
It's Susan the playbook. Weiss, it, it is the playbook. And a hundred years ago, this happened and it's happening again. And if you mm -hmm. don't wake up, they're going to start erasing all history. We already have Holocaust deniers out there. Uh, that was just in the conversation with my uh, with the two Jewish men that I that I interviewed. They got Holocaust deniers uh, out there. People that were that were in the Holocaust are either dead now or very close to dying. Eventually, those stories can't be passed down from generation to generation anymore. It becomes some thing that happened a long time ago, which yeah. means if it's not taught, it can be repeated. If slavery is not taught. It can be repeated. If what we did to the Native Americans in this country is not taught, which it isn't, not truthfully, yeah. no. read up on what Thanksgiving is really about. Why do we still celebrate, celebrate Columbus Day? Right. I love that people are making the move to change it to Indigenous People's Day, but not enough people. Well, I mean, on, on our, <laughs> even on our Apple calendars, because... And we got iPhones over here. You Android users, I don't know what it says on your phone, but we got iPhones over here. On our Apple yeah, calendar, it says... Indigenous People's Day. And Columbus Day. Yeah. So, we got, look, that was my two cents. <laughs> I just find it, you know, I, I hadn't heard of Moms for Liberty. Um, Somebody had to put me on to that. Somebody this put me onto that and I researched them and I was like, oh, I've seen this playbook before. That's the Daughters yeah. of Confederacy. I've seen it before. Yeah. They just changed the name. They changed Daughters to Mothers and Confederacy mm -hmm. to Liberty, which is the new name for everybody who used to fight for Confederate rights, right? right. Or who used to say, it's just stars and bars. No, no, no. No, wait a minute. The American flag is stars and bars. The rebel flag yeah. is, what they call the rebel flag again? I don't know. I thought it was stars and bars. I thought it, I thought that was so. What's the American flag? Stars and stripes. You there? You go. All right. So I had it right <laughs> yeah, the first time. Yeah. I should never I just, question myself. This this is not going to be a hot take because real folks know this. <laughs> this is not going to be a hot take. Um, but talk thinking about Moms for Liberty. <sighs> White women have the potential to pose the greatest threat to democracy, freedom, inclusion, and justice. And it's either through this kind of rabid conservative Christian ideology that is a mask for racism and bigotry. Because it's not just racism, it's all out bigotry um, against themselves as women against LGBTQ folks, against anyone who isn't Christian, who isn't wealthy, who is disabled, who is, is an, it's all, it's a, it's a well-rounded, they're doing real good on their bigotry. Or you got the flip side, this idea of, I don't, I don't see color, this kind of, that, that kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> erasure of otherness and of difference. And I, see it presenting itself in their refusal to accept the idea of intersectionality as a real force imposed upon people in this country and having an effect on people in this country. And by because the way, they, that's mm -hmm. on both political parties. What you just described w mm -hmm. is one party. The conservative movement is one party and the I don't see color is the left. That's why I didn't differentiate. Yeah. I said white women uh, either <laughs> with but, this But idea there are some white women out there who are fighting for the cause. Yes. So so let's put the disclaimer. We're not talking about all we, white we, it, women. I, I, I'm, beyond, I'm beyond doing the not we have all to. disclaimer. We, we have beyond to. It. I'm beyond it because a hit dog will holler. If, 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 a, if a person is coming up to me, well, wow, we're not all like that. A hit dog will holler, period. If if it doesn't apply, let it fly. I'm not talking, obviously, about all people. People are not a monolith. I mean, even within the white woman who proposed a threat to freedom, it's, it's on two opposite sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Either you don't like being uncomfortable, so you would wrap your, your one of those, what, what King, Dr. King called um, the moderate, which is really what is the greatest threat to freedom 
and to justice is the white moderate. Either you're that and you're you're fine with uh, uh, quiet complicity. That's right. right? You're complicit. You're complicit in it when you don't right. speak out. Right. You don't identify as a racist, but you're not actively anti-racist. Like or, some of those people that claim that they're not racist, but still voted for Trump, which means right. that racism, somebody else being racist is not as big of a, a deal to you. qualifier right. to you. Right. Their threat to my way of life and to my freedom and to my liberty, to my life, period, is not a deal breaker for you because of the financial incentive of voting for him, right? Mm -hmm. you, have, you have that type of person. And, and so, no, it's a spectrum. Yes. And you fall somewhere on that damn spectrum. And it's just like Muhammad Ali said, if there's a thousand rattlesnakes coming and I knew 10 of them was good, 10 of them didn't want to bite me and I had a door I could shut, should I let them 10 in and hope that they stand up against that thousand that want to bite me? Or should I close the door and protect myself. So I'm beyond, I think we're beyond this kind of respectability politics of, well, not all of you, obviously not all of you. If you keep making this not all argument, you're only doing it to derail what I'm actually talking about. I there think we've all, we've all established that we're not talking about people as if they're a monolith. But what I'm talking about is not personal, it's political. I'm talking about white women in the political sense. I'm not talking about each individual white person, which is why I say I am beyond this uh, this not all thing. Because when I talk about men, I talk about white people, I talk about conservative Christians, I talk about Republicans, I'm talking about it in the political sense because these are real life political, social political implications. These are not personal attacks on people. And when they whittle it down to that, it just derails the whole conversation. So we're not doing that. In 2023, we're not doing that. So you could just kick rocks. We're not doing that. But it's white women have a meeting. So one of my good have friends, a meeting. one of my good friends who's white, <laughs> heard one of our previous conversations about uh, white supremacy and it was after the, the midterm elections mm -hmm. and she sent me this and shout out to you. You know who you are. Uh, I'm going to quote you. She said, white women will always protect white male supremacy because they still be benefit from the closeness to the power of the husbands, brothers and dads. Okay, the final segment. We went heavy, and I don't feel yeah. like being angry no more. So I let me got mad. Yeah, and I'm no, not gonna got... lie. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I mean, this is this is it, if you if you think that this stuff isn't real to us, yeah, you just realize how real it is. Like we're affected by this. It's an it's yes. insulting when you try to get rid of the atrocities that we've been through by saying that they're not valid. And that's essentially yeah. what DeSantos, DeSantis is saying, but that's not, this, this segment is going to be about laughs. We're going to bring it down. We're going to tell some <laughs> jokes because last, look, last week, <laughs> la last week, Jay, you was mm -hmm. talking about your damn shenanigans of your jackass stunts that you would do yeah. in the house. Now yes. I, you call it uh ladder stair luge. I, I did do stairs luge. Stair yes. luge. Now there was one yeah. thing that you that you said I'm I, I, I'm gonna save it for next week and I can't remember what it was. But what was it again? So yes, when I was a teenager, uh mind you everybody, she was a teenager. Yes. Middle school, high school, the so jackass was on M T V. Uh, I'm dating myself. I don't care. Uh, I'm grown. Yeah, we, yeah, we all. I don't care. I don't care about being cool. Cool is for the young people. Mm -hmm. Cool is for young people because it's a placeholder for personality. So I, um, I was really into the show Jackass, and I like doing stunts. I've always been a, you know, the person that I just. I've always been doing. We. I, I feel like all three of us were kind of crazy. You were too. We talking about you right now. Okay, but anyway, the thing that I had mentioned last time, it was called living room pole vaulting. Yeah, that's right. 
Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> what the hell is living room pole vaulting? Like, what is living room pole vaulting? Well, I'll explain it. So, uh, I we used to take karate. Yes, we and did. And yes, we, we got pretty far along. And we, did. Uh, yeah, we, we started using uh, weapons. And the first weapon we got was a bow staff. And if you don't know what it is, it's a long wooden staff right. and you beat the hell out of somebody with it. Okay. And we did and to I, each other. Yes. So what you do with living room pole vaulting is you take that bow staff. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if any of you watched the Olympics or, or any, you know, track and field, whatever, you know what pole vaulting is. You see where I'm going. Yeah, I see what okay? you're doing. This bow staff was about six feet long so it's a long bow staff so you take this bow staff and you run <laughs> in the living room and you pole vault over various things in the living room <laughs> like what the couch <laughs> <laughs> if you have a very large uh coffee table we had two ottomans that sat next to each other. You could pole vault over those. My favorite was pole vaulting over the back of the couch because if I fell or something, I'm just falling onto the couch. Right. Um, right. But you try to see if you could beat your height, um, if you could get over, if you could clear the couch without um, killing yourself and without also touching the couch. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. This had to be when mom and dad built the house. Yes, that was in high school. <laughs> Jay, time out. Yeah. Mom and dad built the house. I was 21. You were 17. You was, was a senior 16, in high school. 17, no. yes, no, yes. No, no. Yes. Okay, you were 16 when when we when y'all moved in because I was still in yeah. college. I turned 21. It was like they were still, we still had to like unpack. But yeah. like you was legit, like when you were doing this, yeah. You I was, was a teenager. You was barely still a teenager. I was definitely, definitely had the mind of a of a teenager. I was a child. <laughs> no, you were the child. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. You was a like, year away from going to college. Yeah. It made no, I would, if, if I still had the ability to, I would still be doing all of that stuff today. But wait a I can't minute some of this stuff with my kids like i can't wait to put my children down the stairs on cardboard boxes into a bunch of pillows at the bottom of the steps i can't wait to do that wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. last week we talked about how you and adam were destroying the house putting holes in walls and covering up it with was one hole no it was one thing that i was responsible for <laughs> The rest of the stuff, I believe y'all were. You don't want to tell the story where you almost burnt down the house and I had to stamp out, stomp out a fire that you had set on the patio and deck. No, you were not there. Remember, I was standing in the flames when dad found me. You were not there. No, you there was another left. time you were setting fire to some paper towels, but it was right next to the gas tank. I don't remember that. I there were a lot that. of fires. There were a lot of fires. I was a little pyromaniac. I'm going to be honest with you. I set mom and dad's carpet on fire in their bedroom. Oh, my God. But the way you finesse that is I took a pair of scissors and I cut off all the burnt tops of the carpet. And so all you saw was just carpet. It looked like maybe if you look closely, you could see where it dips a little bit. But really, it just you just go and you cut off the burnt end. But hold on. Mm -hmm. So... We've already established that you might be a little destructive with some of your things that you and Adam would do. And here you are doing yeah. living room pole vault and yes. mom and dad's newly built house. At no time did you think, well, maybe I shouldn't do this because I might break something. No. Listen, <laughs> listen. <laughs> this is, uh, first of all, I was a professional. I was a professional stunt. <laughs> person um i was very professional and you know when you on the quest for greatness you gotta break a few eggs you gotta take some risks and um 
I believe in everything I did and I, I apologize for nothing. And I can't wait to replicate every last thing that I used to do with my own children. And my house will be a disaster and I'll love it. You crazy as hell. <laughs> but, but on that note, that's going to do it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Jay, you got yeah. anything to say to the people before we leave? You know, I, I still don't have a sign off and um, I don't know what's going on with my friends. Like, are y'all just not, are y'all, have y'all not getting bitten by, uh, you know, a uh, creative bug or something? Nobody has given me any ideas of what my sign off should be. So it's still just bye. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm a holler. Thank you for listening unsolicited perspectives with bruce anthony please subscribe like comment share and donate donations help us keep giving you this free content each and every week until next time howdy five thousand freedom peace freedom over fame freedom over fame the cycle stays the same freedom